Well, uh, thank you everybody for coming along to our second in a series of three um, property development focused uh, seminars for the year. They, these are joint seminars that we're putting on between the commercial disputes team here at Bardia Perry and the property team. Um, and this one, as you know, is um, focused on combustible cladding. Now, I did want to have something we could burn tonight, but I've been told that's not allowed, so but there may be something to, to, to touch during the course of the presentation. So tonight we have uh, Bruce McKenzie, um, who is from Sergon speaking first, um, Sergon Building Consultants, um, and then followed by Mark Glynn, who's a senior associate in the commercial disputes team here at Bardia Perry. Um, in terms of Bruce and uh, his, his background, he's the National Manager for Commercial Services and Major Projects at Sergon Sir Building Consultants, um, which is a division of Sedgwick known as the largest risk, risk management corporation in the world today. He leads a commercial team of experts managing a wide variety of building projects nationally in the insurance and private sectors, including property damage, cat catastrophe and large scale remediations. Um, started. Um, doing a carpentry and joinery apprenticeship, um, I think 30 years ago, um, then set up his own building business and became a preferred government contractor uh, in that, in that uh, phase of his working career. He joined, or Bruce joined Sergon five years ago um, and was doing homeowners warranty uh, where they were predominantly in the domestic con consulting business. He then focused on commercial projects and launched a commercial services division, including project management. I can't say too much about this aspect of it, but uh, I can say that Bruce is currently involved in the lacrosse litigation. Um, you can see the building up on the first slide there um, as an expert. So he's um, all over this issue and the perfect person to be, to be speaking tonight. Um, then, um, after Bruce, uh, Mark will be saying something about the legal and regulatory environment that um, combustible cladding sits in in New South Wales and Australia today. Um, Mark um, is uh, a key driver of our building, building construction team uh, here at Bardia Perry and um, you'll, you'll find a bio about him in the pack that you have in front of you. And um, in a past life, he was also an accountant and worked as an insolvency practitioner. So um, knowing what happens in the building and construction industry with a lot of companies, those two specialties often tie in together. Now, I mentioned the pack that you should have found on your chair. I just wanted to take you through a couple of things in there. I don't want to take too much more time. There are slides or copies of the slides that you'll see tonight. There are um, bios for the two speakers. There's some literature about our building, construction and property expertise here at Bardia Perry. And also a couple of flyers, one for our, um, our, our online debt recovery product, which is a letter of demand product, which is very cost effective. And also something that we have put together uh, very recently, which is a, a facts and figures booklet about uh, in relation to building construction disputes. So. There's a whole lot of information in there for homeowners, councils, builders, contractors, principals. Uh, something to take away that you may find of interest. So I won't take up any more time and I'll ask Bruce to come up and uh, get underway with the presentation. Thanks for that intro. Um, I'll just cover off on a couple of things first. Um, my role with Sergon, um, I've been here for five, five years now with the business, um, is the national manager. I'm not a, a fire engineer or a certifier or anything like that. I know there's those sorts of people in the audience, so challenging me on those sorts of issues, I probably won't be able to respond in the way you might like. But I do have a lot of experience with the cladding. Um, as mentioned back in 2014, when the lacrosse fire happened, um, our business was involved, um, and we've been involved ever since with costing uh, and helping the legal practitioners through the steps of um, bringing it up to where it is today. So, um, so that's, that's kind of my uh, background in terms of the lacrosse and the business. Um, I'll get straight into it and, and what I want to cover off on 
Mark's going to cover off on obviously the legal sides of things, but I wanted to sort of try and introduce the audience to the product of polyethylene, the reason cladding is combustible and go into the uses and that sort of thing. Um, I apologise if anyone's sort of seen some of this material before, um, but I, I thought it would, would should um, sit in context to the way we sort of eventually talk about lacrosse and some of the other projects. So, um, so I'll start off with the first slide. What is combustible cladding? Um, so it's known as uh, aluminium composite panel or ACM. They're the two acronyms used widely in the industry. Um, it's made up of 100% polyethylene, or at least that's the, um, that's the worst case. There are other versions of that which I'll come to. Um, it can be made up of a combination of materials as well. So by percentage, it can be polyethylene mixed with other inert material. Uh, the product, it's been used in Australia for over 40 years now and globally much longer. Um, this, this panel um, is common to most people in Australia here. Um, it's probably only been in the news since 2014, since lacrosse had its issues, um, but it has been used for a very long period of time. Um, some of the benefits of this product, it's obviously economical, uh, decorative, flexible. Um, there's some of the, the benefits of that. Um, Mark's got some samples there that I brought along. Um, these samples don't represent a polyethylene cladding panel. What they are are the new compliant material. Um, one's a honeycomb core, another one has got a fire resistant core. Uh, the fire resistant core product with the white uh, inner core is, is a good demonstration of what the non-compliant product looks like, which is a, a darker grey or a black core. Um, what is polyethylene for anyone who doesn't know? It's the most commonly used plastic in the world today. Uh, 80 million tonnes annually, that's what's produced of it. These are some examples of, of the use of polyethylene. Um, the product is not recycled, recyclable um, and it's a mixture of polymers and ethylene. Um, so ethylene is a hydrocarbon which is a flammable gas essentially in its simplest form. So it's a little bit scary when you look at the product that way that it's that, uh, that flammable. Um, you would have seen drives lately with the, the keep cups for coffee and all that sort of thing all along the lines of the fact that this product is not recyclable. Um, how combustible is it? Well, um, it depends on the size of the fire and, it's, and it depends on two, two different elements. Um, obviously the amount of material that's on, on the building, if it's cladding we're talking about, and what's known as the energy release, which is megajoules per kilogram of the actual material that's present. Um, so those two combined um, give you the heat of combustion. Um, I will highlight, I'm not a, a chemist or a, um, anyone who knows too much more about it than that, but what I can demonstrate to you here um, is a product like concrete, stone or glass has a very, very low um, megajoules, megajoules per kilogram. Um, the worst, or, or right up in the high end of the scale, is petroleum. Some of these other products, as you work your way up the list, timber, laminate, uh, fiberglass, um, rigid thermal insulation board, um, polyurethane and expandable polystyrene, which is known as EPS. Um, a lot of people might know that, that foam product that's used in a lot of domestic housing and that sort of thing these days. Uh, and right up the top, almost as, um, as, as flammable as pet petrol, is the polyethylene product. So clearly um, it, it's a very, very uh, flammable product and it's created the issue that we've got today. Um, the product itself and how it evolved. So starting way back when we talk about 40 years, uh, things like signage, uh, was, it's a flexible product for that kind of use. Uh, and it's, it's also used in shop fronts and, and um, building signs. Uh, one of the benefits of this actual product is how lightweight it is. Um, and when we look at a, an awning shop front like that, adding any significant weight to that when you're replacing signs and things, often um, you end up with engineering problems and things. So it was used widely for that sort of thing. This was initially. The product then crept its way through into low-rise buildings and facades, and we ended up with the problems we have today, which is high-rise buildings. So uh, the image to the right there is, is actually Grenfell Tower before it um, went up in flames. Um, and you can see the, the use, which is fairly extensive from top to bottom um, on that building. The types of cladding, so in, when we talk about polyethylene and ACM, or, or um, sorry, ACP, um, the actual panel, there's four different categories and, and the way we define those, or the way our business follows in particular, is, is through the ICA process, which is the Insurance Council of Australia. So the Insurance Council of Australia have taken a little bit of a lead and they've pub published a bit of data on the way that they want um, the types of cladding rated. 
so that it assists the industry in general in terms of how uh, we determine what's acceptable and what's not. Um, category A um, is, is a product that has from 50 to 100% polyethylene in the core of the material. Um, that's an example of it there. It's kind of similar to the sample we passed out. Um, category B um, is known as a fire rated product. Uh, and this product contains no more than 30% of the polyethylene and the balance is made up of inert materials. So um, there's different fire properties that they mix in with those inert materials to, to make up what's deemed a fire rated panel. Um, moving on, category C um, is known as 7%, no more than 7% 7 polyethylene or 93% in the inert materials. So again, this is um, known as a fire rated product and I'll point out these, these products are deemed acceptable on class A and class B uh, buildings. And finally, um, and um, it's in line with one of the samples I passed out before, the category D, uh, which is the honeycomb core product or a solid aluminium product that um, is aluminium throughout, um, that's known as a 100% non, non-combustible product. So that, that covers the range of the products and on any building when testing is undertaken, it's important to determine uh, how combustible that actual material is and where it falls within this scale. Um, I'll move on. Some people are probably aware if you watch the news and you live and breathe cladding like me. Um, yesterday there was a ban introduced in New South Wales uh, and that ban was on the Category A material uh, and that's a material that has anything in excess of 30% of the polyethylene core. So um, that ban's in place now and just a, a footnote off the, the website where they're issuing the bans, it's in accordance with the, the Building Product Safety Act uh, and you can see the fines there that they're going to introduce uh, for non-compliance with using this product. So they've got quite serious in New South Wales at the moment. They're the first state that's actually, actually introduced a ban uh, in accordance with their state law. No doubt more to follow and we'll, we'll come up to that as we go through the slides. Um, just on that topic as well, the, um, the notice that they issued, which was only yesterday, I've only just added this slide in obviously, um, was issued um, to do with two types of building, type A and type B, and it lists the classes of buildings that fall within those. So just to clarify that, um, I just came up with a diagram to explain what it does affect. Obviously class 1 and, and class 10, that's domestic and uh, non-habitable, are not impacted. The areas that are impacted, however, um, class 2, 3 and 9 and class 5, 6, 7 and 8 buildings. So with these buildings, you'll, you'll, you'll notice on the left-hand side there, those buildings are a sole occupancy, residential, hostels and a building of a public nature. Most of those relate to buildings where people sleep overnight, for want of a better word. Uh, the ones on the right hand side, office, commercial, uh, manufacturing, uh, other buildings, they fall under a slightly different category. If we're looking at height of buildings, the type A construction three storeys and above, it's now banned. Uh, type B construction two storeys and above and clearly if you think about any building two storeys and above in those categories, we're talking about a lot of buildings. Um, so uh, type A and type B construction for the other classes of buildings, the bands have come in for four storeys and upwards for type A, three storeys for type B. So that's probably a diagrammatic look at um, how it impacts and certainly from two storeys and up on a type B, it, it's going to have a big impact. Um, how is the uh, ACP on buildings dangerous? Um, we'll talk about some of the reasons it's dangerous for other, other than the obvious that the, the product is flammable. Um, the penetrations on the, the product of the edges is, is an exposure and it's an area where uh, the product will ignite in the first instance, obviously, and once it does ignite, it, uh, the product melts very, very quickly. Aluminium being the product it is will, uh, will disintegrate fairly quickly as well. So the ignition point for the product is very, very low. The spread rate's high. Once it's ignited, it's difficult to extinguish. And some of those examples are um, Grenfell, for argument's sake, where you're putting fire on an aluminium panel trying to extinguish, whereas the fire is actually behind the aluminium and it's burning, or it could be within the cavity. So clearly, there's issues once this product um, ignites. Uh, it burns upwards, but more importantly, the polyethylene drips downwards as well. So an example of La Crosse building uh, was where, and also Grenfell, uh, these fires did not start on ground floor. They started up four, six floors of the building. 
they burnt <laughs> upwards, but the the, uh, the polyethylene and the melting um, aluminium dripped downwards, ignited in a downward direction. Uh, obviously, a big downside to that product. Um, the aluminium itself does break into burning debris, and I've got a photograph later on that shows an example of what happened in the lacrosse building. Um, and when, I, when it's over four storeys or more, clearly it's difficult to access for fire appliances and extinguish and that sort of thing. So there's a number of uh, reasons why it's clearly not a good choice. Moving into the material use and, and substitution, so this is something, um, again, when we talk about uh, the product itself, it can be used different ways. And when we talk about non-complying, uh, non-complying is a product that actually complies with the minimum standards, however it's not put on right. So it, it's something in the installation process hasn't been done correctly. Uh, or it's substituted in the wrong application. There's a few examples there. But clearly, Lacrosse and Grenfell are two examples of the right product used, but it was used in the wrong way. In other words, the product itself is not banned, but they've used it in a situation where they shouldn't have. Uh, Non-conforming, on the other hand, is different again. And I'd liken that to substitute products where they um, produce a product that simply does not conform to the standard that we have. Um, there's also counterfeit products or imitation products on the market today. A very big part of what's going on, and in terms of labelling even, uh, it's got to that level where there are products with brand names that are recognised in Australia and overseas, and in fact, they're no different to the Rolex you buy in Bali. They're an imitation product. So that's another problem as well. More often than not, those products have the highest flammability level, and they sit in that close to 100% being polyethylene as the core. Um, I've got an example there, <coughs> and if you look closely, you'll see on the face value, the polyethylene, uh, the ACMP uh, panel looks exactly the same. It's been finished the same way for whatever reasons, but we have two entirely different products. The one on the left-hand side is a fire-rated product. The one on the right is polyethylene. So it's an example also of a use uh, where it's unexplained why there's two different products. The fact remains there shouldn't be. They should be the same uh, product used on that um, structure that's been used. So it's another problem, uh, and we find this, our business works in this, this industry of uh, examining buildings with this product, and, and clearly um, this sort of problem is occurring as well. So I'll talk just a little bit about lacrosse building um, that I've had involvement with. Most of these images are images we captured back in 2014 when the fire occurred. Our business responded first uh, in conjunction with our loss adjusting arm, Cunningham Lindsay, to the fire. Uh, we're responsible for the property damage um, that occurred uh, where the darker column sits and the crane is sitting there. Um, it's known as Unit 5, uh, and it's Unit 5 from top to bottom. It's a replicated floor plan. Uh, the fire actually occurred on the uh, eighth floor in this instance, uh, on the balcony of Unit 5. It was a cigarette in a tub. I, I'm sure everybody's heard the story. It was a a French tour tourist who had a cigarette outside, stuck it in a plastic tub, ignited it, it was close to the panel, things went on from there. Um, the aluminium composite panel was part of an external wall system uh, known as a Luca Best. It spread vertically to the top of the building, it also spread downwards to the podium level below. It did not spread horizontally, it's an interesting fact. Um, this particular building, there's quite good um, compa fire compartments across the building. It was managed to, to be contained within those unit fives on each level. Um, they early uh, in Australia here we have an early evacuation policy where occupants are uh, vacated from the building early. In this instance, there are alarm systems and sprinklers throughout the building that activated, and clearly um, all the occupants got out. There were no fatalities in, in this instance for this building. So part of an external wall system, I just want to explain that because I covered that off on, uh, before. An external wall system, for anyone who's interested in the facts, is, is where we have a, a, a metal stud wall on the edge of a slab, plasterboard on the inside. It's made up with insulation within the wall. There's also sarking that sits and covers those sides. I haven't drawn that in just for clarity. We've got a batten system and then we've got our um, panelling that sits on the outside. You can see in the image there, it can be either continuous running down past the slab edge or it can stop at the slab, slab edge and start um, when it comes in below. So that's an image of, um, of lacrosse, and uh, you can see uh, an example of the wall system there, the way it's made up, the stud inside. 
That's not the balcony where the fire occurred. Uh, I've got other images of that, but you can see the makeup of the wall system. The point I'm making is uh, a wall system is, is the entire external wall of the building. It's not an attachment, such as an added on product to an existing building. Um, another image of the balcony there where the seat of the fire was. And the image to the right hand side there shows the kind of um, molten debris that spits out from the building when the fire occurs. And this debris, if you can imagine, is, is uh, ignited when it does fall off the building. This was spat out for uh, quite a distance away from the building when the fire occurred. Uh, and clearly that has the ability to ignite other things. The fire builds from there. So a very, very big problem with the, the use of that product. Um, I'll just talk about the recladding complexities. Just excuse me for a sec. So just working through some of the matters I've been working through over the last sort of um, 12 months in terms of recladding the, the building and I've been working in conjunction with other experts in our business. Um, some of the factors that, that have quite an influence in recladding this building and, and a lot of people don't actually know where the building is exactly or, or some of the difficulties but the location, it sits right next door to Etihad Stadium and it's in fact connected and the parking is all connected. So a lot of complexities in getting access to the building to actually undertake any kind of building work. Um, weather plays a big factor and this building is exposed very much so to weather which I'll come to on the next slide which has a very big impact on the building. Uh, reason being, a lot of work that is undertaken on the building is, is proposed by abseiling or swing stages which hang off the top of the building. When you get weather events and wind gusts that exceed up to 35 kilometres an hour, you can't work in those conditions. And that has a big impact in this area down in the, in the docklands. Uh, they're subject to high winds and that will have a big impact. So that's had a lot to do with the negotiations and, and the calculations we're trying to come up with in terms of how to reclad. Disruptions obviously are a, a factor as well. The building is largely occupied. Um, unfortunately for the building they've got um, people who aren't supposed to be in there squatting in units, all sorts of things going on um, and that's because they are struggling to fix the building. This has drawn out since 2014 so there's, there's a lot of different uh, difficulties aside from the building um, facade at the moment. Um, decorative screens as well, that image shows on one side of the building uh, a lot of aluminium decorative screens supposedly for shading. Um, they've all got to come off to replace the cladding, another complexity of this actual building. Um, you'll see there the, the Yarra and, and that's obviously facing uh, south from the bottom which is uh, Tasmania so it's, it's subject to all the, the wind coming up and straight up the Yarra River. Um, straight up to the end of Docklands and it hits the building front on. So there's a lot of complications in trying to um, undertake the work from swing stages or other means that where the way it actually has to be undertaken. Um, you'll see here this image is from next to the building next door which is known as the M building. This building was, um, was coming out of the ground when, um, when the Lacrosse building went up and um, at that time they had specified the same cladding so they rapidly went through a change in the specification and the majority of that building is actually glazed now uh, in lieu of the, the cladding for obvious reasons. Um, I'll just go back. You, what you'll see down the bottom there, a lot of that um, blue image which kind of looks like a, almost like a river, um, that's glass and that's an atrium level that sits below for commercial uh, and retail outlets. Clearly that's a, a major complexity in putting scaffolding up or swing stages or any sort of access to that building. So these are some of the the issues we're dealing with in trying to come up with a way to physically replace this cladding. Again, you'll see some more images of it there. Um, so talking about Grenfell now, um, most people are aware of this one. I won't harbour too much on this, um, but what I will do is just cover off on a couple of the highlights. 24 storeys, so it's actually very similar in height in metreage to the La Crosse building. 127 apartments. Uh, the fire started on the fourth, fourth floor internally, so the fire was inside an apartment as, a, as opposed to outside on a balcony, similar to across. Um, the aluminium composite panel was an attachment to the existing building. I'll cover that off on the next slide. Uh, it spread vertically to the top of the building, but in this instance it also spread downwards horizontally, engulfed the entire building. Um, over in um, in the UK they have a stay put policy that's been enacted for quite some time. 
and the residents were uh, in the building clearly for far too long um, and unfortunately that had um, fatal impact um, and that's one of many problems that the Grenfell Tower has in terms of compliance that's come out since the date that this, this fire occurred. Um, talking about uh, an attachment which is a little bit different to, uh, Grenfell, uh, to La Crosse, um, if we look at a concrete structure and the building I will highlight is, is predominantly masonry and concrete uh, and it's, it's been written in reports since this date that the building would never have ignited the way it did had it have never been reclad. Um, insulation was added to the outside of the building. Uh, on top of that there were uh, clips that take the, the cladding product, they're run vertically. Uh, that creates an air gap and a cavity. The cladding is installed over the top of that. Um, the next part of the system is a cavity barrier which is, is designed to be installed at each level to prevent the, uh, any fire or smoke from rising up inside the cavity. So you'll see there a picture of that orange cavity barrier and where it's supposed to be sitting. Reports since this fire have revealed that the cavity barriers were installed upside down back the front, wrong size. Um, the cavity was known to be around 50 millimetres in width. Some of the cavity barriers they used were only 25 millimetres, so clearly they were ineffective and, and it was a big part of um, what went wrong on that building. So in effect what you end up with is a chimney, the air gets sucked up, it comes up from the bottom, it runs through in that, in that cavity that sits between the insulation and the, uh, and the, and the cladding and in this instance the, the insulation was also flammable. Um, and I will highlight as well on La Crosse and also Grenfell, a lot of this cladding in some instances is fixed by a clip but it's also fixed by a double sided tape that holds to the building and that tape is flammable as well. So really in a lot of instances these buildings don't have a hope and this one was probably the extreme end. Um, the, the red you'll see in the image above there just shows a little closer where the cavity barriers are supposed to be installed and not only between levels and compartments but they're also installed around the windows obviously and that was the known penetration point of this fire that came through um, where a window cavity seal barrier was not um, compliant or it didn't seal correctly. The fire made its way in there and that's an image of, of La Crosse as the cladding was being erected and one of the, the major problems on this building were the columns, um, an architectural feature and a structural feature that created a chimney, oh, sorry, created a chimney and the fire uh, in most instances ro uh, rose up through those columns and spread horizontally at each level as it, ma as it made, it what made its way up to the top. So that's those two buildings. I'll just talk quickly about um, traditional versus modern construction and I think any designers or anyone that's sort of involved um, in that phase that might appreciate this. Um, that, that's an example I could find of the, the most basic um, straight up old building <laughs> or traditional building I would call it. Um, what we can see there is clear delineation of compartments. So we can see our compartments horizontally and vertically. The spandrel panels, a spandrel panel is, is the panel that sits between each floor of the building. Very evident um, and most people would remember the older style high rise building that had the protruding spandrel panel that came out. Part of, of um, traditional architecture I'll call it. Um, most of the, the floor plans were duplicated from each floor so clearly um, Creating compartments for fire separation is a fairly simple process or, or, or easier to, to undertake on a building like that. If we look at some of the buildings we have these days, and this is reality, and I know this is extreme end, um, but it was probably the most extreme image I could find. Um, there's a greater desire for aesthetics these days. Everything's got to look good. Um, what it's doing is it's challenging the National Construction Code and standards beyond their design, beyond what they've got written in there. They don't cover buildings like this. So we end up starting to delve into to deem to satisfy and other provisions which is where some of the haziness comes in. So this is demonstrating um, why some of these problems are starting to come about. Um, there is unclear delineation. So if, as you can imagine if you were trying to work out where the fire compartment sat in this building, it's a lot more complicated. Um, so the fire separation and the design is challenged in a very big way. Um, if we look at a building like this, um, we can see spandrel panels sitting in the background uh, running across. This building's being reclad um, and it's, it's replacing the, the dated look. Um, 
and it's rarely, rarely, rarely you see buildings these days with those vandal panels protruding. Below is, is a, a very typical example of a modern building you see today. They're all over the city. We've got glass from top to bottom. We've got panelling, concrete, um, or it could be the, the aluminium composite material top to bottom, and it's aesthetically pleasing. And what, um, what, what's occurred there, there could well be fire separation sitting behind there with cavity barriers and fire stops, but we can't visi visibly see them anymore. They're covered up, and we're relying upon certifiers and experts um, to, to certify those products. There's, there is a, a slightly greater degree of um, possibility where non-conformance can happen, um, and that's just the, the industry we live in today. So I'll just talk quickly about the, the state response um, in each of the states and then come back to New South Wales. I put this in for perspective. I know everybody, most people here are from New South Wales. Um, our business deals nationally, so we see a lot that goes on uh, everywhere else. Uh, in Victoria, um, so there's what's known as the Victorian Cladding Task Force put together. Each state has done a similar thing. Uh, what's been inac activated there is a statewide cladding audit which commenced uh, on the December 2017. Uh, it was predominantly government buildings that they've covered off on. Um, there's new VBA inspection powers that have, have come in and that's to do with disclosure and uh, providing information on what's been put in a building. So um, some of these things have, have been activated as part of the cladding task force. Um, the Metropolitan Fire Brigade and the, the Victorian Building Authority are taking the lead and they're communicating with the building owners where concern is being identified on particular buildings. Um, there are orders being issued for rectification. I've seen them myself. Um, and these orders um, are putting a lot of responsibility back on the building owners to, to get something happening. Uh, one of the newer provisions that's just come in, uh, which is the reason that text is in red, uh, is finance, finance options now being offered by, um, through, through the, uh, the government down there which are subsidised through rates uh, and they're, they're extending it to a period, I think, of 10 years where they're allowing um, the uh, owners of the buildings to pay off the cost of this cladding. So they're looking at taking a proactive approach to get something happening with it down there. Um, that's that's uh, Victoria specific. Uh, Queensland, on the other hand, um, they have what's called the Non-Conforming Building Products Audit Task Force. 30th of June, that one started. 28,000 buildings, they, uh, building approvals they reviewed and 1,000 buildings uh, were referred to this task force. Uh, again, predominantly government buildings. Um, they've got a chain of responsibility there um, and that was established where they're holding all parties accountable through the supply chain. So you would be talking about suppliers, you would be talking about installers, the person putting it on, you'd be talking about certifiers. Um, there's a lot of different um, parties that are that are getting drawn into this at the moment. Um, that's the, uh, the position that the Queensland Government have taken and, and, and shot off in. Um, they have new powers to seize. Uh, those powers to seize, again, are uh, along the lines of seizing documents and evidence where they can uh, help to prove where, whether a building does have a problem uh, and then they can instigate orders to, to activate. Um, some of these buildings I'm showing, Brisbane Square, the bottom one is the... Um, the PA hospital in Brisbane, which is um, all, all have combustible cladding installed on them. Um, the orders in Queensland, they're being uh, issued for self-assessment. So what an order looks like really to a building owner is, is forcing them to identify, go out, test and establish what they do have on their building um, and, and it, it runs from there. So very much so they're putting the onus back on the building owners in, in Queensland. Um, New South Wales. So. We have what's called the safety, Fire Safety and External Wall Cladding Task Force. Um, the data that um, we can receive off the, the website indicates there's uh, 2280 sites inspected so far and 417 require further assessment. Uh, the couple of images there, uh, predominantly Canberra actually, um, of, of uh, properties that have got the cladding. Uh, again, predominantly government buildings. Um, in April 2018, um, there were amendments passed to the home building laws administered by Fair Trading, and it deems this product unsafe ex uh, an unsafe external wall system as a major defect. Uh, and there are orders being uh, issued for self-assessment at the moment. Um, I had a look at an order with one of my colleagues before I came over, and I will indicate the orders are, are very brief, and, and some of them, or one of them I've just read, uh, is, is from the, the um, Fair Trading, and it's been issued to a building owner stating your building, uh, you'd be aware that cladding's an issue and your building has been identified as having cladding on it. 
Um, it doesn't say it's combustible, it just indicates that it has cladding on it. And this is some of the, um, the concern that's being raised at the moment, that there is um, an assumption of guilty until proven innocent. That's a law term. <laughs> Um, there's an assumption of that through some of these notices because uh, I guess what they're doing is trying to put the, the onus back on the owners to, to go out and to be proactive and establish themselves whether they consider they have a product or not. So we, we could have a situation where we've got buildings that in fact don't have any combustible cladding at all or anything that remotely looks like it, but they may have been issued an order, uh, as a please explain. What is the expectation of authorities? Um, so there is a bit of a defined process nationally. I covered this off on earlier. Uh, the Insurance Council of Australia have teamed up with Fire Protection Association and Engineers Australia. Their process is published uh, on a website. It's quite defined in terms of how they want to deal with uh, this, this product in terms of testing and, and inspecting. Um, the notices at the moment are getting issued to uh, building owners uh, and the owners are expected to self-assess. So uh, it's up to the owners to find and engage various experts to undertake these inspections. Um, some of this can include auditing of documents um, by a, a consultant, um, samples removed from site um, on anything that's suspected and these products tested, and then we move into the design phase of it is in terms of a, a fire engineer and how, um, how you would actually deal with um, treating that building. Um, the testing itself, um, runs through uh, Australian standard performance requirements. Um, the ma there's a material and there's an external wall systems um, standard, uh, which is 1530.1 and 5113. These two standards are utilised by the testing laboratories who run the tests. And at the moment, we have CSIRO and CTEC are the two companies that have been endorsed by the Insurance Council of Australia as being um, authorised uh, testing laboratories for this product. It doesn't mean they're the only two that can test, but they're the only two that are supported by the Insurance Council. Um, from an insurance uh, impact point of view, and I'll just quickly cover on property, uh, I won't cover off on any other topic. We deal more in property and we deal in the insurance sector, so probably have a little bit of insight as to what's, what the movements are and what's going on. Um, we're seeing some insurers are conducting audits to establish a risk. Um, new policies are subject to greater scrutiny. Um, the duty to disclose of an ACP on a property similar to asbestos is something that gets talked about a lot. So again, the onus is back on the building owners to determine whether they do have a pro product of concern and activate a process to try and get a certificate or a, an assessment done. Um, there's been an obvious impact on property value where the uh, ACP has been identified Clearly the cross is an example of that and I do know stories of massive devaluations of units and property but certainly anything that does have an ACP on it I would expect would be difficult to, to sell at its proper market value at the moment. Um, premiums have risen in cases where ACP has been identified. Again this is something we hear and, and we speak to clients and different people about. It's something that has been occurring. Uh, and another point to, to note lenders. Um, their concern where failure to maintain insurance will breach mortgage covenants, uh, another uh, impact to the industry. Um, obviously there's a liability risk also when uh, an aluminium composite panel has been identified. Um, again, I'll highlight property owners are ultimately responsible for, the, for its identification. So stakeholders in the process, there can be quite a number of stakeholders and we've just listed uh, some of the ones that could potentially be involved here. Um, clearly there's a lot um, and at the moment there's a lot of uh, interaction between various stakeholders trying to liaise with each other and work out a solution. So it is a very, very complicated and difficult process. The larger the building, the larger volume of cladding, it can be more complex. Um, when an assessment is undertaken, I'll highlight um, a building itself, although it might have aluminium composite panel, the cross is probably a good example. Um, I think it's less than you know, 15% or 20% of the building is actually covered in the product. Um, an example of Grenfell, 90% of the building was covered in the product. So there's different variations in how much is being used and a lot that comes into the assessment that the fire engineers get involved with. So it is a very, very messy process from there. Um, a phased approach uh, to combustible cladding, so this is something we practice as a business and this is something I guess we recommend uh, to anyone that, that gets involved. Phase one 
again aligning with what the Insurance Council are doing at the moment, is, is a document audit site investigation. Phase two is inv invasive inspection testing, expert analysis, tender and rectification. So I'll just run through those quickly. Um, the phase one is a construction document review and clearly if you do get a notice or something happens, one of the first things you really need to do is have a look at documents, get hold of whatever is possible through council, through the original developer, through the, uh, the strata or the body corp or whoever holds those documents, just to determine whether there's anything that looks suspicious there. Um, and certainly identifying on site if there's anything suspicious looking. Um, the second phase on that is invasive site inspection. So what actually occurs here are samples are taken from site. So to conform with what the Insurance Council's process is, those samples are, are 50 millimetres, so it's a, it's a round sample around about that. Uh, it's drilled into the cladding in a conspicu conspicuous place. They take the sample of the cladding. There's also a look that happens inside the cavity in terms of sarking, insulation material, uh, cavity barriers if it's visible. Anything that can be taken <coughs> excuse me, from that sample is taken at that stage to help understand what the, the risk is in that place. Um, the testing then gets undertaken through uh, the either CSIRO or CTEC, those testing authorities. That's if we're running with the Insurance Council's process. Expert analysis after that. So once it's established that a product is combustible and that level of combustibility will come out of that test and where it sits in that um, A, B, C, D um, graph that we looked at earlier will be determined at that phase. From there, fire engineers, facade engineers, certifiers, building consultants, quantity surveyors, there's a whole array of experts that can get involved at that stage to determine where we go from there. A lot of what can be done at that stage is determining the extent, uh, a scope of what that looks like, and then the reason we've got quantity surveyor in there is we start to talk about cost, which is on something Mark will cover a little bit more, but cost is obviously something everybody wants to know about. It could be a portioning of uh, different elevations of the building might cost different amounts where staging can be implemented to, to get something happening. Uh, tender and programming, uh, this phase obviously is um, one we follow where we will run through, uh, run tenders on what's got to be done. We'll look at things like the lacrosse example where access could be a problem or some of those other provisions and work through to build up a scope that's realistic um, and, and doable. And from there obviously the, uh, the final phase which is proceeding ahead uh, and that would be in conjunction with all of these specialists that are involved, including a certifier, obviously, and a fire engineer, and the, and the parties that need to be um, involved at that final sign-off. So that's my presentation. I don't know whether anyone's got any questions. I'm happy to take them now, or I'm going to save them until later. Yeah, we'll yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, good evening, all. I just want to pick up and continue our session tonight and have a look at the, uh, the most important issue or the next relevant issue in this uh, topic as to who is liable and, and maybe give you some ideas and some tips as to how we might move forward and manage that risk for p people involved in the industry, be they the builders, the developers, or the design consultants that are engaged in these large projects. Uh, like Bruce, I too prepared my paper before the announcement uh, yesterday where cladding of certain types was put on the banned list and I was all set to tell you that uh, submissions had been called for and closed and we were waiting a decision to see whether cladding ended up as a banned product under the new bit of legislation. Uh, Bruce has told us that it, it did and that has, it's timely because there has been other pieces of legislation that will be affected by and take notice of products that have been put on this banned list. Cladding now having been put on there, it will flow through into some of these other bits of legislation that will affect uh, people moving forward, which I'll discuss as we go through. So I want to just start with a, a comment or a quote that came out of the Senate committee that talks about determining who's at fault and who's at liable for the cost is going to be a vexing interest, not just in the case of lacrosse, but also other buildings where there is cladding has been identified and that gives rise to a number of practical commercial and legal complexities. Bruce has touched on in some depth about the practical applications, the access issues, particularly using lacrosse as the example. You've got access working from above in a high wind tunnel area. 
alongside the water with this glass vestibule over the top where you've got public thoroughfare underneath. That's going to provide some practical applications and obviously anything in terms of rectification that's going to add to cost. But there's also the issue of legal liability which is complex and whilst the response and who's going to be responsible for the rectification costs and that's going to lead to an examination of the various contracts that have been entered into during the various phases and stages of the construction project, looking at the relevant legislation and also the common law as people negotiate and position themselves to try and determine who's going to be liable or where liable, liability does sit. As Bruce said in his, his, one of his last email, uh, slides, there are a number of stakeholders or interested parties in this whole process and whilst he suggests yes they are working together to solve the problem, equally they're now going to be jostling to see who the, whether or not they can shift risk and liability across to each other to see where it actually lies. So who is potentially responsible? The one thing we did get from Bruce's presentation, there are a lot of stakeholders and equally there's going to be a lot of parties that may be responsible. We've obviously got the product manufacturers, they're going to be in some circumstances are going to have responsibility. The importers, the wholesalers of these products, obviously we're very aware from what we read and, and the proceedings that are, we'll talk about shortly down in Melbourne, the approvers or the, and certifiers, the design consultants are certainly going to come in for their share of scrutiny. You've got the developers and you've got the builder and then you've obviously got the building owners and the, occupant, the owners corporations in the case of a multi-storey residential building. Ultimately the rectification costs are going to lie with the owners but they're going to be looking to see whether or not there is any way that these rectification costs can be passed through and try and establish where, where the liability doesn't lie somewhere else in the construction stage. So what are the legal obligations? Just as we've got numerous potential parties that may be responsible, we've also got numerous sources of legal obligations that are going to come under under scrutiny are going to be examined quite thoroughly. Obviously you've got the contracts as I mentioned before, so people are going to be looking to see whether there are breaches of contract. You're going to be looking for negligence. Were, were there any breaches of any duties of care? Are they able to establish duties of care and what level of duty of care is owed from a consultant to a developer or to a builder, depending on the contractual arrangements and whether there has been a breach of that duty. Obviously you've got the statutory warranties that we all know about under the Home Building Act. And as Bruce touched on, I'll talk a little bit later, cladding has now found its way in it within the definition of a major defect which gives it some uh, influence and impact, sorry, impacted by these statutory warranties. You've got the Australian consumer law and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we head through which is also going to play a part in looking at the allocation of liability in this instance. And then the other legislation, the work health and safety legislation, the environmental and planning legislation and obviously compliance with the National Construction Code. As of yesterday, we can include there the Building Safety Products Act too, which is going to have a role in this. So what I thought I'd do, given that we've got a number of interested or parties that may be responsible, we've got a number of sources of the claim, I too thought that I would just look down on the lacrosse proceedings and talk about some of the issues that have been raised in there. I should say that I or the firm haven't got any involvement in the lacrosse proceedings, so really the information that I provide here is what I've been able to source of my own, uh, of my own efforts. So uh, I haven't had the benefit of seeing the pleadings, but certainly what we know about lacrosse is that the City of Melbourne's ordered the Owners Corp to replace the cladding, the Owners Corp seeking to recover the costs from the builder L.U. Simons, and it's been prosecuted, prosecuted in the Victorian Civil Administrative Tribunal with a 30-day hearing starting at the beginning of September. So, a lot of interested parties eagerly awaiting to see that not only the conduct of that, those proceedings but ultimately where the liability is deemed to lie. So by way of background, L.U. Simons was engaged as a design and construct builder. There was, no speci there was a specification called for composite panelling but no particular brand was specified and it was specified as Bruce mentioned for external walls including balcony walls and under that, their contract, all materials were to be provided to the superintendent for approval. So some of these points that I've raised here in the early stages you'll see are relevant when we start to look at uh, where the parties are alleging that true responsibility for the rectification costs may lie. Elia Simon says, as part of their uh, 
commentary on this that the use of a Luca vest in buildings of this type has been a common practice for the last 40 years, or at least 40 years. Not sure whether that's going to help them in the legal proceedings, but certainly maybe gives us some idea of the extent to which the problem is existing out there. We've all heard they've likened it to the asbestos uh, situation. I'm not sure about that. I don't have enough knowledge on that. But certainly, it, on all indications, it's a significant issue and one that won't go away quickly or cheaply. Right, so let's have a quick look at what these proceedings, to the extent that I am aware, are based on. L.U. Simons is reported to allege that the building surveyor or the certifier, as we refer to them up here, was novated to L.U. Simons and it approved the use of Aluka vests. And the, the certifier issued the building permit and if the certifier failed to stipulate that there would be no storage on the balcony. The architect, Elie Simons is saying the architect was responsible for choosing the cladding. Now what the architect says in response is that he was, he was engaged to choose the colour of the cladding and that his brief and rare of responsibility didn't go to that extent and that um, really that, that, were, that responsibility resided with the superintendent. So you can see already there's some shifting as to who's going to be liable and what the various parties uh, believe they were responsible for and the extent to which liability may attach to them. L.U. Simons, on the other hand, says that the architect didn't provide a specification suitable for construction purposes and that they failed to perform their specific services required under their consultancy agreement. And particularly what they're talking about there, as they, they say, is that the architect failed to perform adequate inspections, failed to report to L.U. Simons as it was required to do, and wrongly, wrongfully certified that works had been carried out in compliance with the design documentation that had been issued for construction. As I say, the uh, architect on the other hand says that they were only engaged and their responsibility extended only to choosing the colour, that the superintendent was responsible for approving the cladding and really that the, the building, the builder, L.U. Simons, remembering he was engaged under a design and construct De project delivery, he was responsible for ensuring that the product met its project specification. The owner of the, par the apartment, there's an allegation that the owner of the apartment failed to ex exercise reasonable care not to create a fire hazard in the use and the occupation of the unit. Not so sure how far that one will, will get, but nonetheless. And the occupant, as uh, Bruce mentioned, the French tourist who's since departed our shores, he was the one that went outside and had the late night cigarette and you know, at the beginning is responsible for the actual causing of the fire. So the proceedings, the owner's corp is obviously looking to claim the costs of rectification back against L.U. Simons. Now in this situation you've got to remember that the owner's corp didn't engage the builder. The owner's corp is a subsequent owner of the property after the developer. So really there's no contractual rights between L.U. Simons and the owner's corp. Additionally, there's a general reluctance in the courts to extend or to recognise the duty of care of a builder to subsequent purchases of these commercial buildings. So, it, as I understand it, the Owners Corp is pursuing L.U. Simons under the consumer law, the Australian consumer law, and relying on sections 140 and 141, which deals with the manufacture of goods and the liability to compensate a person if the goods have a safety defect. Now a safety defect is defined in that act as where the safety is not such as persons, persons generally are entitled to expect. Now you might ask yourself, well Elie Simons is not the manufacturer, but Section 7 provides that a person who imports the goods into Australia, and these panels apparently were imported by Elie Simons directly into the country, and a person who imports the panels from a manufacturer who doesn't have a place of business in this country is deemed to be the manufacturer. So the Owners Corp here is relying on the Australian Consumer Law to try and seek some of the liability back to the builder where otherwise there's no contractual arrangement between L.U. Simons and the Owners Corp. So the, there's a claim against the building surveyor and a claim in negligence based on a breach of duty of care. And you'll see as we move through this that there are a lot of claims here for negligence and a breach of duty of care. And this is to be expected in a situation where you've got consultants who are engaged to provide matters of professional opinion or professional judgment. 
And I think if we go back to Bruce's earlier point, as we've seen a shift away from the traditional to the more modern types of uh, architecture and construction that people are demanding or that's being required these days, we move away from the more traditional types. And as Bruce indicated, I, I take his word for it, that the standards are not keeping up with the design requirements. And obviously that the, the designers and the certifiers are relying on these deemed to satisfy principles, which are a lot more subjective. And I think we can... I think that we can safely say that these sorts of matters of professional judgment are going to come into scrutiny, particularly when we find that found ourselves in these types of proceedings. So there are the claims. I'm probably running out of time a little bit, but you will see as we move through these, there are allegations that the surveyors or the certifiers negligently issued the building permits, approving design documents that didn't comply with the code. Certainly under the consumer law, issuing a building permit was misleading and deceptive because there's an allegation that it represented that the panels were compliant. Claims against the architecture, again for breach of duty of care, as I mentioned earlier. The architect, it's the allegation is that the architect failed to check the sample. The architect, of course, has a different view. And that the design failed to comply with the act. The LU Simons expert says that the architect never provided a specification suitable for construction purposes and therefore failed to fulfil its services pursuant to its agreement. So you can see there there's a lot of dispute and a lot of uh, work that's going to be taken through, is going to have to work through in these proceedings to see where liability will finally rest. But again, we've got a number of players, a number of potential parties that are responsible and they're all going to be looking to protect their position and see whether or not the liability doesn't rest elsewhere. There's a claim being brought against the fire engineer, again, for breach of duty of care. Whether that's able to be established or not, the courts will determine, but also relying on the engineer's report as being misleading and deceptive and bringing into play this, the Australian consumer law provisions. Claim against the superintendent, as I mentioned, the superintendent, as I understand, has been joined by the architect. Again, breach of duty of care in, it, in that the superintendent failed to detect the builder's non-compliance with the construction and the design specifications. And what the architect is saying is that the superintendent was responsible for signing off and ensuring that the construction methods met the design documents. Superintendent was required to receive and approve all the materials and obviously the materials were required to comply with the legislative requirements and that was an area of responsibility that the architect says rests with the superintendent. The latest uh, notification or uh, publication that we've got in terms of the next lot of proceedings is with Lend-Lease. Lend-Lease has been ordered to replace the cladding at the Royal Women's Hospital. And so Lend-Lease, Lend-Lease obviously having a contractual relationship with the hospital being the principal, Lend-Lease is suing its consultants to re re recover these recladding costs and they're alleging a breach of the contract by the consultant for failing to notice that the design documentation included the use of a combustible material and failing to make Lend-Lease aware that the cladding didn't comply with the building code. And the, the rectification costs, as, as, as is reported, is around the $8 million figure for the women's hospital down there in Melbourne. So you can see that Again, without repeating myself, there's been a number of players involved, a number of sources of liability that are being explored and agitated that extend to terms and contracts, as well as legislation and negligence. And you can see that this is going to take some time for these proceedings to move through, and we'll see where the dust finally l lands. Each case will be different because there will be different terms of the contract, different consultancy agreements that will come under scrutiny in different factual situations. But I think it's fair to say that most players in the process need to be very cautious and need to accept that in the event of uh, some sort of disaster or a rectification order being issued that they're going to come under some form of scrutiny. And I think it's particularly important for those that are engaged to provide professional judgment. And as we said, those sorts of issues will come under scrutiny as we move forward. So Bruce touched on quickly what the response has been in New South Wales. I don't think I really need to go through that other than to say that in New South Wales there's been a number of buildings that have been uh, uh, inspected. A number of them have classified as high priority and 222 there are residential. 
It's an example, as Bruce spoke again, about the self-assessment and letters being issued out to building owners, advising that they've been identified as having being owners of buildings that do have cladding and obviously asked to undertake some testing themselves and make some recommendations with a view to rectifying and minimising the risk. So I won't dwell too long on there. I want to talk now about some of the legislative changes that have arisen as a result of primarily the cladding but also now have greater effect with cladding or cl Category A cladding being included on this banned products list. So the Building Products and Safety Act which has given rise to the banning of Category A uh, cladding as part of the task force's 10 point plan and its objective was to prevent the unsafe use of building products that goes without saying but it also extended further than, so, than what we've seen in some of the other states in that they're identifying buildings with unsafe building products and where those buildings have been identified there is a regime in place that allows for the issuing of notices that could require rectification of the buildings that are affected by past use of unsafe building products. So if you've got a building that has an unsafe product that was put previously installed on the building it will still be caught by this by this act once it's identified and the, we could give rise to some new concepts that we need to start thinking about which are those, those of an affected building which is a banned build, a building where a banned building product has been uh, applied, an affected building notice which is a notice issued by fair trading and a building product rectification order which will be issued by a relevant authority which we suspect might be a council and there might be under those rectification notices um, obviously a requirement to eliminate or minimise the safety risk posed but could extend to remediating or restoring the building through the removal of the cladding. Interesting to note that a banned product, uh, sorry, a product that's listed on the banned products listing notwithstanding that it might be approved under the code the product will prevail so it's not going to be an excuse for the use of category uh, A cladding if it's a, excuse me, if it's a banned product if it complies with the code. So this will prevail over the code. Right, that's that point there. So this is one of my slides that I prepared prior to um, the announcement of cladding being put onto the list. So they have called for submissions, the submissions have come in and what we ended up with was at the beginning of the week that the uh, Commissioner issued a notice of intention to ban the product under the Act she's required to give 48 hours notice to suppliers of the product that's going to be banned and then it came into force. What does this mean? Well in this case it means that we're going to a regime in place now for the issuing of affected, affected building notices and building rectification orders which I touched on earlier. So there have been some amendments obviously to other acts and regulations that I just want to touch on. You may or may not be aware of those and Bruce certainly touched on but under the home building regulations cladding as defined by regulation 69A as cladding likely to cause a threat to safety of occupants of a building is a major defect. There's also under the Home Building Act now they've expanded the definition of a, ma a major defect to include the use of a product in contravention of that act. So up until last week cladding wasn't, wasn't a major defect, now category A cladding is a major defect under the Home Building Act. Obviously what is the effect of that? it brings into play the six year statutory warranty period for breach of the implied statutory warranties that, that that act contains. Also amendments in the conveyancing sale of land regulation. Now there are the usual pre the prescribed warranties that the land is not subject to an adverse, adverse affectation unless it's disclosed in the contract. Adverse affectations now include a building product rectification order that has not been fully complied with or a, and an affected building notice that is in force. So you can see the impact of cladding having been banned under the Building Product Safety Act will now flow out to the amendments that have been made in other areas of the law. Again in the strata schemes management regulation a certificate issued under section 184 now has to disclose the particulars of any outstanding orders and those particular particulars of outstanding building product rectification orders under the Building Product Safety Act. So there again is more disclosure that's going to be required under that uh, regulation. The Environmental Planning Act, the 149 certificates need to include a statement about affected building notices or any outstanding building product rectification orders. 
So again, you can see how the, the impact is going to be taken up by some of these other acts. The task force has proposed amendments to the environmental planning and assessment regulations, which is going to require building owners with combustible external cladding to make declarations to the government and to undertake independent fire safety assessments. That's going to be a two-stage approach should it be accepted. There will be a registration stage where the owner is required to register with the Department of Planning and provide details about their building and their combustible cladding. And then within a certain period thereafter, they must uh, proceed through to the, the statement stage and they've got to provide the DPE with a cladding statement. Now cladding statement is going to be a statement that includes that the cladding on the building has been inspected by a properly qualified person, that the person's determination as to whether or not the cladding prevents a risk and then obviously details of any uh, action that's going to be taken to address that risk. So again some release for consultation the 16th of February and we'll see what happens with that one. So managing the risk in your consultants, your construction contract. Bruce touched on one of his last slides what the steps that he's recommending that be undertaken should you identify that there is cladding on your building going through the various audits. What I want to look at very briefly is how do you provide yourself with some sort of protection or how do you allocate risk in, in your contracts and in your projects moving forward. We all know that contracts allocate risk and when situations arise, the first port of call is to go back to the contract and see what the obligations called for on the various parties. Where do the obligations lie? Where did the parties agree that certain risks for certain instances would lie in the event that they occurred? Obviously, what, a lot of what I'm going to suggest here is, is fairly obvious, but I think it's timely that we look at obviously accurately specifying the scope of work. So we saw in the lacrosse example there's some argument between the architect and the surveyor as to whether they were proving uh, cladding or whether they were just identifying colour. Obviously without wanting to be flippant or simplistic about it, if we accurately specify the scope of work then hopefully we can avoid some of those sorts of areas of inconsistency and areas for dispute. Have a look at the specifications. Maybe as designers or certifiers can we incorporate more testing requirements. Maybe we specify the types of testing that's required for samples. Maybe do we even include them in the specification as hold points pending appropriate certification. Bruce has indicated really that the Insurance Council is recommending two sources of uh, testing on cladding and so maybe what we have to be as specific of that in our specifications to require testing by a recognised authority i.e. or even specify those and actually incorporate them into the design maybe even by way of hold points so the work comes to a stop and cannot proceed until such time as the appropriate testing has been provided. The same might apply for certification. There's a suggestion put forward that fire engineers ought to certify the initial design for fire. Probably an appropriate thing to do and then again maybe certify at PC. So again looking to clarify and allocate risk and managing your risk within your various uh, contracts as consultants to the uh, project. Maybe look at making a requirement that certification is provided, maybe even specifying from where the certification must come and as I say, you know, consider thinking about whole points to stop the project until such time as appropriate certification or testing has been conducted. Have a look at the warranties that you're being asked to provide under the contract because obviously that's going to go some way to working out down the line in the event of a dispute, what were your obligations, what did you undertake, to what extent have you breached your duty of care. Have a look at the warranties. Obviously, you know, contracts we start with, the, oftentimes we start with standard form contracts but we all know they're all heavily amended these days as people attempt to shift risk. And really that's what the amendments of a contract are, aren't they? They're shifting risk away from you or taking on risk that is within your risk profile. So look at the warranties. Look carefully at the warranties that you're being asked to provide under your consultancy or contracts or your DNC building contracts. Obviously you need to have a look at the adequacy of your insurance because that's going to come into play. What I often suggest is that with uh, builders who are asked to provide certain insurance requirements is that they run the requirements under the contract past their brokers to make sure that they are adequately covered, look to see whether there's a need for any gap insurance that need to be, ought to be considered. 
Have a look at indemnities. Again, depending, depending on the balance, of the balance of power between the parties to the contracts, there's a heavy emphasis now to push indemnities onto contractors and contractors also to enforce or push indemnities back down the line to subcontractors. Have a look at the indemnities and in what circumstances you're giving those indemnities. Maybe you might seek to provide a limitation of liability. I certainly know the AS4122 Consultants Agreement provides in an XRA a, a component or an insert for a, a capped amount of liability. Maybe that's what you ought to be considering. To what extent are you willing to bet the farm? And maybe you ought to insist to the extent that you can on capping your liability. Also have a look at to what extent your liability is going to, uh, the extent of your liability is you're going to limit it just to direct loss. In other words, you're going to exclude consequential loss. We often see that. But again, we often see contracts come through where there has, consequential loss has not been excluded under indemnities. That's a very risky situation to put yourself in. So you need to have a look at these types of clauses that are scattered out through these 100 page contracts, be they building contracts or consultancy agreements that are drafted by lawyers making, trying to shift the risk away from their client onto someone else by the imposition of these indemnities, trying to expand the scope of the indemnity. And you need to be aware when you're looking at your contracts and to take note of the indemnities and see what you are in fact signing up to. And have a look at the proportionate liability, whether or not it's been excluded under the contract. It's often a clause that appears at the back end of the contract where proportionate liability is excluded so there's not the option to apportion uh, liability to concurrent wrongdoers. So you want to have a look at that clause as well and have a look and see what's, what the person who's provided the contract is trying to achieve by doing that. Obviously, again, allocating risk under a design and construct contract, you know, the principal want to have it excluded because the principal just wants to take action against one party. He doesn't want to have to deal with other parties along the way. So there'll be some negotiation in and around that point that you might want to look at. So they're just some areas that I think that uh, certainly uh, builders, principals and consultants particularly that we're talking to can have a look at in their contracts. Uh, as I said earlier, we, we start with Australian, st or we start with standard form contracts, but it's very acceptable these days to mark them up, to amend them, and it's all about allocating risk it's probably worth the work to be done at the beginning end of the contract to have a, have a look at them, have a careful review of them and see if you can, whether you're happy to accept the risk depending on your appetite for risk, depending on the extent of cover that you've got sitting behind you with insurance and determine whether or not this is an acceptable contract for you or whether you do push back. It's all about allocation of risk. So I'd urge you to have careful and close look at your contracts as you uh, move forward, particularly in this latest environment and obviously an implied term there, the duty to act with reasonable skill. Don't, don't remember, don't forget that. All right, that's the end of uh, my presentation. So if anyone's got any questions to myself or to uh, Bruce, now, now would be the time. Great presentation, guys. Just a quick Thank one. You. I'm with Ross uh, Fire. I'm assuming that they were fully insured and the owners' corporation are acting on behalf of the insurer. Is that not the case? Uh, look, I'll be honest with you and I say I don't know because I, I would assume that would be the case, but I, I, I really don't know because I'm not that close to it. I just picked that as an example where we could work through some of the likely causes of action. But have you, have you got any comment on that? Green for go. I'm on. Um, the, owner, the insurers are working with the owners corporation at the moment, so I believe it's a joint um, process that they're working on. Um, that's probably all I, I know on it at the moment, or all I can say. Because that, they would be fully insured, is that Correct, there was yeah. property insurance. Insurance has not said they're not insuring. No. Not that I'm aware of, but again. I'm sorry to be vague on that, but we, we, we don't know. We're not close meetings um, to be able to answer that with any greater confidence than that. Yes. Um, oh, um, thank you very much. Um, the you mentioned that the state base have their own provisions around how they're tackling this issue, and they seem to be quite reactive and, and not trying to come in guns blazing, taking a different approach and putting on to the owners and, and landlords of these buildings. Um, what's your view on nationalising this topic and having a standardised approach? Um, 
And, and do you expect it to get worse? Well, it sounds like at the moment, if Wales take the lead at 30% PE, it's acceptable, but is, is that likely to basically become a, okay, we're not going to have any plan for it? What, what's the view on that? Um, I think that the ban of the products um, altogether won't happen on the basis that it is used for signage, it is used for other things. So I, I doubt that that would happen. Um, what I will say, a national approach to the whole cladding situation would be a very practical thing to do, but it's not occurring. Um, and at the moment, different states are leading different things. For instance, Queensland at the moment are leading a charge in terms of product labelling. For them, the product labelling is a big deal and they want to lead a national approach with that and hopefully implement it across. So what, what would be a good scenario at some point is if these cladding task forces merged and the conditions were the same for all of them, uh, particularly for the construction industry and for us as consultants and every, everybody else, I think that would be the practical way forward. But I don't have any um, answer as to where each state's up to at the moment in terms of doing that at the moment. Certainly, um, I would say Victoria are ahead in, in what they're doing, um, but that, that's, that's probably all I can say at the moment. And I, I think if I could just uh, raise my other great area of interest, security payments is a classic example where you've got different regimes in different states, and whilst there has been a review conducted with a view to nationalising that, which would make perfect sense, uh, if it comes in, one could only suggest that it's been a long time coming. So what... Yeah. question about finding solutions for buildings. Uh, we have fire engineers at the moment that are reluctant to uh, give a performance based solution on a non-compliant product. Uh, so we have a building at the moment with a non-compliant product on it, but instead they'll be keen to give us a risk assessment of the building. They've um, deemed the building as being a low risk. I'm just wondering on the legal position in accepting that risk based assessment, uh, because the building still not meet the requirements, but can we then accept that risk based assessment? Right. Gee, I, I would have thought it would be risky if it doesn't meet the, the code requirements. I think um, you'd be looking to get obviously some sort of certification that you felt you could rely on, but I, my, my gut feel without think about it on the sp without any great depth is it would be risky to accept that. I don't know, does anyone else here have a view on, on, on that? certainly one thing that's going to come into play will be the insurance coverage on it and I, ve I very much doubt the insurers will accept that. So um, certainly that's one, going to be one aspect. Would I'm not sure that I understand. I'm not very. F I'll be honest with you and say I'm not particularly familiar with that section, other than to say that it's now been extended out to include the um, the banned products. I'm not sure if anyone else can help me out of a tight spot here. I might have to take that question. I'll come and see you, and I'll uh, undertake to get you the answer if I may. Apologies for that. Uh, it's a good question. So most of the product is manufactured in um, United States, Germany, countries like that. Um, ironically, the product is banned in those countries. They don't use it themselves, but they're happy to <laughs> distribute it. <laughs> That's a fact. Um, no, I'm not aware. Uh, there are distributors in Australia. So what, what actually happens with the product is it arrives here in sheet form um, from overseas and they do bending and folding and um, there's quite a process involved in that. Um, the way it works is the contractors on site will provide measurements back to the factory who will fold it up, send it to site so it's ready to install. So as, as far as the physical manufacturing of the product, I'm not aware. Uh, but certainly um, there's plenty of businesses in Australia now who are using a compliant product. Um, with the commentary on different states have different regulations, Stage of the legislation. Is there 
Um, I think that would be a, an Australian standard or a National Construction Code approach. Uh, at the moment, no, we have a state like New South Wales who has taken a stand on what they believe is um, what they need to do to protect, I guess, their state. Again, what would seem practical is a national approach, particularly with the task forces, but it's not occurred. Um, on my gut feeling is it probably still won't occur. If it does, it'll be, it'll be a number of years away. So, but at the moment, yeah, it's it's a state by state approach. Reading the ABCD report which came out after the report expired, one of the key things I took from that was the difference between the cross and the landfill was a different standard of fire protection. And with the cross, my understanding is the sprinkler system was above standard. So we assume that it was only standard. Yeah, I couldn't answer that, but what I will add um, with lacrosse, um, the weather conditions were quite different, so it was very, very still. So the the, um, the fueling of the fire through winds and things, and I spoke before about uh, the fact that that building sits in a wind tunnel. Well, this happened at a time of, of night um, where the conditions were perfect, it was very still. Um, so there's certainly been reports that if the wind had have been different, it could have been uh, vastly different. Um, the sprinkler system, yes, it was above code. Um, there was recommendation to put sprinklers on balconies and all sorts of things after that, but that's not happened. But certainly, um, it made it had a very big impact on the building to suppress the fire. Um, the damage that we were involved with uh, after that fire um, was uh, insignificant internally. It was smoke. It was a bit of charring. It was nothing too um, too, too, too bad. It was ex um, mainly the balconies, the balustrades, the tiles, the glazing that um, was damaged. That was the extent. So as, as dramatic as it looked, it probably wasn't as bad as what it could have been. Look, and just finally, um, Mark, with, with liability and responsibility, the developer was a quick finger designer. Designer was a finger back so ultimately, we assume the, the owners of those individual units will, will be the ones who have to pay. If they can't establish liability elsewhere, absolutely. I think ultimately it's going to rest with the owners to, to rectify. If there's a, a rectification order that's issued that requires that the cladding be removed and replaced, it's ultimately going to lie with the owners. And this is the basis of the lacrosse proceedings, is that the owners have been ordered to replace it. And so now the, the, you know, the arguments about where liability lies w will be had, but you know, ultimately it's the owner's responsibility. In terms of compensation, um, obviously there's going to be a large element of compensation for actual rectification. Mm -hmm. um, but we, how far does that actually extend? So we're hearing about um, stories of pain where the, the value of properties is seriously diminished. Uh, I think the, the Conveyancing Act covers off um, the duty to disclose if there's going to be an order, if there's an order that's in place on the building or if there's other, any other activity. Um, how far, I know there hasn't Necessarily been precedence today around cladding in particular, yeah, yeah. but how far in your experience well, does compensation extend? Yeah, sure. Look, I'll just make the opening comment is it will depend whether or not it's just under general liability or whether it's been claimed under an indemnity. An indemnity would allow one party to claim th their loss subject to any limitations in the contract. But really, the general principle at law is that it must be. Um, loss that was a, a naturally arising from the breach. So to the extent that you could extend it, you know, to indirect or consequential loss way beyond, there would be some, some limitations on that. But I think, uh, you know, certainly under the indemnity clauses, they're the ones that you really need to be looking out for because they are the ones that extend beyond what's recoverable, sorry, extend the recoveries beyond what's generally recoverable at law. So the roundabout answer, way of answering your question is, it, it has to be a loss that naturally arising from the breach, but 
I caution just in regards to indemnities because that extends the experience of recovery. Okay. Yes. Um, given that in most or a pro high proportion of um, residential um, buildings in, in Sydney are <coughs> when they're developed and uh, built by um, companies that have a very limited life, um, and it's once the building is identified as being covered with uh, the main product, that's unlikely that there will be some Awesome. Is the insurance company then uh, likely to have any role in the replacement of that when there probably hasn't been any threat of a, an incident? Or well, I, it would depend on the policy, but I don't believe so. I mean, particularly in the event that there's been no damage. I mean, you're looking for you're really looking for coverage of a defect under a under under a contract where there's a non-compliant product but there's no actual damage. So in terms of the rectification cost, I think that in that situation it would reside regrettably with the owners of the apartment. That's what I was thinking. That yeah. It really is a legislation task to chase the shadow. Uh, that might be one view of it. I mean, I, you know, at the end of the day, someone's ultimately going to be responsible. And if, you, if the liability doesn't crystallise with any of these other parties that are backed by insurance, then I think that, um, yeah, it will, that will be the effect of it. It will be residing with the owners. Mm. Um, this is just a side question, but one of the drivers I've noticed of the whole cladding scenario is now a much tighter emphasis on fire services inspection, testing and maintenance in buildings and there are all kinds of changing regulations on the Environmental Act with sign off of administrators done by competent fire yeah. safety professionals. I was just saying part of the fallout I use that phrase sure. from the cladding group is a tightening of the whole maintenance regime and I work for a proper practitioner under the Fire Protection Association right. and they are big drivers of that. So I don't know if Bruce has come across that as part of your general involvement. Yeah we have we don't we don't um uh, do any work as a competent person in that space, but it's a large concern for us. We see competent people who are clearly not competent um, in that space, um, and they they could be anything from a, a tradie who once installed a, a a fire alarm at one point or anything. So it's it's very broad. It's a concern, a big concern um, for us. Yeah, I understand that's why some of the rules are classification to deem the competent under the building professionals board, for example. Yeah under an accredited industry organisation. So I'm just saying is part of the process that this has drawn out is the industry needs to be tightened up and that's what's starting to happen now. It's already in place now. There's new mm. rules, there's new forms, there's new everything. So I'm just saying at least it's all part of the process to improve the fire safety on buildings. Yeah, I agree. And I, what I'll highlight as well, we've just had a, a, a lengthy discussion about cladding. Most certainly cladding is not the only issue in this industry with non-conforming products. Um, there's a lot more and we spoke about you know, shelf companies who start up and are gone. Um, our business uh, in itself, Sergon, do a lot of work in that space in assisting owners corporations in, in uh, managing repairs where essentially they pay for it themselves. Uh, it's not covered through homeowners warranty, it's not covered through insurers uh, and they've got no leverage back on the, the builder who's since gone or the developer. So it's a sad fact of the industry at the moment. Um, but I would say um, combustible cladding is one of many non-conforming products. It's just the one that's getting the headlines at the moment. Thank you very much. Okay, we've gone a little bit over time tonight. Um, some very good questions there. Obviously a topic that um, has struck interest with everybody, so why don't we um, continue the discussion over drinks and some food. Before we do that, though, we want to do two things. One is draw your attention to this slide, which you've probably already seen. Um, 23 October is the date for our next um, uh, seminar in this series, Tips and Traps of Property Development in the Foreign Market. Hopefully you can come along to that, mark your diaries. Also, I'd like you to join in um, um, thanking our uh, 
uh, presented in the usual way.